official podcast of the Jacksonville Public Library. I'm Hurley Winkler. And I'm Jenna Hassel. We have two journalists on our show today, Eileen Kelly and Gary Mills. They recently created a podcast, so they are fellow podcasters, and their show is called Have You Seen Kamaya? Jenna, can you tell us a little bit about this show? Yes. So Eileen Kelly is an investigative reporter for the Times Union here in Jacksonville. And she started this podcast with Gary kind of going through the story of the infant that was stolen from a Jacksonville hospital in 1998. And it was kind of to commemorate the 20th anniversary of this story. And I think she wasn't in Jacksonville when it happened, but she remembers covering it and the 10 year anniversary and such. And so she kind of goes back through and um, really tells the story in a very interesting way in a format of a podcast. So the story is um, there's a 16 year old girl that was pregnant and gave birth to a baby in Jacksonville, Florida. And eight hours after she gave birth, someone stole her baby from the hospital. And it was actually a woman that, was posing as a nurse in the hospital and she spent time with the lady, the girl that had the baby, her name was Shannara. And Shannara was there by herself. Her uncle just dropped her off at the hospital. She was a child herself to have the baby. And so this nurse came in or supposed nurse came in to, you know, talk to her. She helped change her clothes, you know, gave her water and food and, you know, gave her baby to her when she wanted her and put her back in her bed. And she was in there for five hours. And then as soon as Shannara started to get tired and go to sleep, she took her baby, Kamaya. The nurse did. The nurse, yes, took Kamaya, put her in her purse and left the hospital. And it's kind of crazy when you listen to the podcast that this lady wasn't from Jacksonville. She was just driving through and almost impulsively stopped at the hospital. And she had just had a miscarriage and, you know, was in a kind of rough relationship. And he was basically like, I want to be a baby and I'll stop hurting you kind of. And um, so in desperation, she took one and and just kind of raised her as her own. Wow. And then years and years later, she was the the baby Kamaya was discovered to, to still be alive. To still be alive. Yes, and she was living with this lady that um that stole her from the hospital and Kamaya, right, you know, she didn't know that she had been that that wasn't her real mom and lived a, you know, seemingly normal life and was raised um to have all the, you know, proper things in life, went to school, went to church with her, you know, pseudo mom. And yeah, it's really, really crazy, kind of really devastating. Um, But the podcast is very interesting. It's called Have You Seen Kamaya? And we talk more about it with Eileen and Gary. Eileen and Gary, thank you so much for coming on Completely Booked today. We're happy to have you here. It's good to be here. Thank you. Yeah. So for starters, are either of you from the Jacksonville area originally? No. Okay. Where from? <laughs> Gary? I'm from St. Louis. Okay. I've been here 25 years this month. So it's like I'm from Jacksonville at this point. Mm-hmm. Yes. And what about you, Eileen? Um, I previously lived in St. Louis, but that was rather briefly. I've moved around quite a bit for work. I came up here four years ago from Vero Beach. And I was there about three or four years. And before that, I was in Cincinnati at the Inquirer for six years. And before that, I was out working for the Denver Post, um, covering the military, uh, living in Colorado Springs, and all over southwest Florida. Um, That's where I started my career. Um, After I went to college, I graduated from college in St. Louis. Okay. So you've been everywhere, it sounds. I have, yeah. Yeah. I kind of climbed my way up the uh, coast of southwest Florida, um, Naples, Fort Myers, Sarasota, and then went out out west to learn that I cannot drive. (laughs) (laughs) So now I'm back in Florida. So what led you to a journalism career? That's the only thing I've ever wanted to do. Um, I bounced around between print and wanting to be a photographer, and in college I studied both. Um, Wow. Just... as a kid, I, I got in trouble a lot for asking too many questions, and I think that I was just kind of born to be a journalist. It's it's really the only thing I've ever wanted to do. Wow. So, but mm-hmm. your family got tired of you interviewing them? Pretty much. <laughs> um, my, my father, I remember him giving me a giant encyclopedia because I was always just following him around asking questions, and he would, you know, shove the newspapers in front of me. We had several newspapers delivered. Um, 
And then he was like, oh, and here's a giant book too. And so I just always had, I was always curious about everything. Um, you know, my father took it well. My teachers did not. I was always getting in trouble for asking too many questions. So what do you like most about being a reporter, aside from getting paid to ask too many <laughs> questions finally? Um, you know, it's, it's a look inside people's lives. Um, it's amazing what people will share with you, you know, invite you into their home or into their, into their agony, into their life, everything that they're experiencing, you know, uh, an illness, a death, um, a horrible crime. And, you know, I think that people do want to talk. They want to be understood. They want to have a voice. I mean, not everyone. Um, you know, I'm not going to lie. There are some days that I feel like a telemarketer. You know, it, you feel, you just feel like you're invading. Like, am I calling too much? You know, um, but by and large, I think if pe people do. They want to have a voice. They want to be heard. Um, I tend to gravitate towards the underdog type stories. You know, um, there's a saying in this business that that you know a lot of people get into it to um, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfort mm. those that you know to open their eyes to what's going on in the world. So, wow. Here what a gift, are. yeah, to get to you know, kind of give a voice to the voiceless, yeah. It's it's a great job. Yeah. It's, I mean, sure, it has its struggles and long hours and pays not great in some places. Some places it's better, but, um, you know, it's the only thing I've ever done, um, and I'm honored to be able to do it, um, so. Well, good, and as for you, Gary, um, in addition to your work as the digital director of the Florida Times Union, what are what are some of your duties at the paper? Well, as I mentioned, I've been at the paper for 25 years, right. and I've started off as a page designer 25 years ago. So basically, I've been editing for 25 years, and now I've gone from editing for print to editing for digital, now editing for podcast, and that's just a small part of what I do now. Right. So a lot of what I do is coordinate with the newsroom to get the latest stories up on the website. We do a number of podcasts that we're getting into now, and um, just a lot of different things. How many other podcasts do you produce? We have uh, three or four we're doing right now. Okay. Um, one is called Jaguars Extra, hosted by Philip Heilman. It's our, with the season starting up, we're just getting that one rolling again. Um, Mark Woods does a page one podcast where he talks to reporters about the reporting process and, and, the, and the stories that they write mm -hmm. that often end up on page one. Okay. That sounds so cool. Mm -hmm. I want to listen to that one, mm -hmm. definitely. I need to subscribe. Um, and we asked the two of you to come on the show because you re recently released a six-part true crime podcast. Tell us a little about your show, Have You Seen Kamaya? Well, um, it came out in July, which was the 20th anniversary of the abduction of a baby girl out of uh, Jacksonville. Her name was Kamaya Mobley. She was kidnapped when she was eight hours old. And um, the case... Back in 1998, it was all over the news for six, seven months, and then it started tapering off. Our paper did a 10-year story, a follow-up, um, and I was a reporter down in southwest Florida at the time, and so I remember this case. I was not up here when it happened, but I remember the television, the national news coverage of it, of an, you know, an infirm, infant being abducted. Um, and then it was in January... 2017. Right. Um, the we have a lot of TVs at the uh, at the newspaper. I pulled bank up on a wall, and um, I was I saw a lot of people gathering under the TVs, and the television was doing a live broadcast from a press conference. And we had been tipped off that morning that there was a major break in an old case, and some of the editors that had been around and remembered it started kind of putting it together and hearing from sources that that this involves a kidnapping, and so. You know, there were people that were starting to put it together, and I kind of was like, hey, what's going on? And and I'm hearing that they were saying that Kamaya Mobley was alive and well, and I was just jumping up and down. like I was like, you got to send me to South Carolina. you got to send me. you got to send me. And, and so they said go. And so I've been following this story since then. Um, and uh, Mary Kelly Polker, the editor, in probably May, um, as the case had been going through the court system, uh, over the past year and a half, she had called me into the office and she said, clear your plate. 
we're going to try something like we've never done before in a pretty short time, but, you know, you guys can do it. And so... How did that feel to be, like, entrusted <laughs> to go on this new journey with, with the Florida Times Union? You know, I've always wanted to do a podcast, um, but I didn't realize I was going to have to pull it off so quickly. Um, yeah, while Eileen <laughs> started the whole research and reporting process, the first thing I did was start finding similar podcasts that I, that I wanted to listen to and that we wanted to replicate or to draw from. And what were some of those? I started with um, Felonious Florida that the Sun Sentinel does. Uh, a colleague of mine from college uh, did the first four parts of that. And it, it's, it's a wonderful podcast. It, it starts off with a great crime. And I, I won't give it away, but it's worth checking out. Um, we also listened to um, Dirty John from the LA Times. Great podcast. And I listened to one out of Roanoke called Septic about a six-year-old boy that, that died when he fell into a septic tank. It, it, it's a fascinating story. Wow, that sounds wild. And, and tragic, I mean. So, and right now I'm listening to In the Dark, the first season of In the Dark, which is, I highly recommend. It's very well done. Terrific. And what did you gain from listening to other podcasts and what did you decide you wanted to sort of take from them and implement yourself? What I most liked about Felonious Florida was their use of music to help tell the story. Um, we weren't sure because we only had eight weeks to, to produce the first episode and essentially the whole series. Um, we knew that we needed, we didn't know what we were going to get as far as fresh interviews from, from participants in the case. Some were precluded from talking to others because of exclusivity agreements. Um, it's just a matter of getting hold of people to participate in the podcast. So we knew that we we're going to need some music to help break up Eileen's wonderful narration from time to time. So I immediately started delving through hundreds and hundreds of tracks on um, Soundstock and trying to find different types of music that might fit the type of podcast that we wanted to do. And it's perfect because since then I've listened to other podcasts and I'm like, where's the music? Where's, you know, like it, movies has music in the background, you know, like when Jaws is coming and, you know, and the guy with the knife outside the shower, you know, you just, and you picked such awesome music and I got a lot of feedback about the music from people saying, you know, this music, I just, it's, it's drawing me in. And then when I can tell that it's stopping, I'm like, no, 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 this is the ending music. So, I mean, he did an amazing job. Um, yeah, because there's even like sound effects too, like, yes. you know, walking down the <laughs> hall and uh, knocking on a door. Mm -hmm. And it really just gives, like, makes you feel like you're in the story. It's really cool. Right. At first I was a little skeptical about using that. I didn't want to, I just wasn't sure it would fit the podcast, but then... To use it subtly like that, I, I think it worked pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was great. Awesome. So you talked about this a little bit, you know, talking about the show, but what first really struck each of you about the story of this tragic kidnapping? Oh, it's just, it's an amazing story because she was, al she was alive and she was not harmed uh, initially. I mean, physically she was not harmed. And that just doesn't happen. Um, and kidnappings... I mean, most kids that are kidnapped, they find them within, you know, a week or so. And, or if it's much later, like Elizabeth Smart, you, you know. Well, and they or, find them dead. Or they find them usually. dead. And, um, and I think that's what everyone just believed, that she was dead. Or there were people that, you know, believed that she was sold into some sort of slavery or, or a drug debt. I mean, but to find that, that here is a, you know, by all accounts, a well-educated, well-rounded, healthy teenage it's just it's unheard of um and then the it's the oh well i still want to keep this mom um her kidnapper it's just it's an unbelievable story right. um and then you know when you look at it from shanara's point of view um it's just it's absolute tragedy right absolute tragedy um what happened to her yeah and i'm, I'm glad you mentioned shanara because i want to ask about some of these really emotional interviews you've had with several of the subjects in the series, um, including, of course, Shannara. Um, as a reporter, what precautions do you take when speaking to a subject who has undergone such enormous tragedy? I try and be mindful. I, ha I am mindful of how often, when, when to give up. And I mean, everyone wanted this story. Everyone was chasing this story. Everyone wanted to get Alexis, which is Kamaya. She's going by Alexis. Everyone wanted Shannara. I held off um, 
even from when I started this story, which was in January 2017, I never made a phone call to her. Um, I didn't go knocking on her door. I held off until I knew I really needed to see her. Um, and I knew that she had not given an interview in 10 years. And she had done really well to, to kind of avoid the media. Um, during some of the court proceedings, people were being mindful that she did not want to talk. Um, but I did go over, I handed her a card, and I told her how sorry I was. Um, and then I, I made one phone call, and she picked up the phone. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I was pretty surprised. Um, but I, someone someone had told her that it would probably, you know, if she was going to talk, that he recommended that she speak to me. And so she said, yeah, you know, I've been expecting your phone call. I heard about you. So what do you think made her agree so quickly? And should, we didn't mention this, but Shannara is the biological mom yes. of the girl that was still. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I simply said to her, you know, we, we met at court. Um, I handed you a card and I told her about a, a connection that I have. And she said, yes, I've heard, you know, good things about you as a journalist and as a, you know, a human being. Um, and she, I said, I just, I, I want you to have a voice here. Um, because since her baby was kidnapped, so much has changed now with social media and so many people were weighing in. Um, and I, I wanted her to be able to tell Jacksonville and the country what she thought. I was not expecting what I heard in general um, with her relationship with her daughter. I had no idea. Um, and there was one moment during the interview where we both just sat there. I mean, I'll let Eileen tell the story, but it was striking to hear those words come out of her mouth. Yeah. So I guess to backtrack a little bit. Um, so in January 2017, she, her little girl's been missing for 18 and a half years. Um, and so she, you know, she, she, the police come to her house and they say, you know, we have an update please come to the police station the next day. And she's like, is, you know, oh my God, is my daughter dead? Because, you know, she sees men approaching the door and they won't tell her. And um, so she shows up the next day and the sheriff is there, the state attorney's there, and quite a few other people. And they're like, you know, we have this news, your daughter's alive. And they took out um, an iPad and start FaceTiming. And so it's supposed to be this amazing, joyous time. But... From Shannara's point of view, it still hasn't been that amazing time. I mean, really, nothing has been... It, it hasn't been her dream come true. You know, she had envisioned for almost two decades of, you know, running through a field and a, a child, you know, which she just, you know, in her imaginary mind, in her mind, she's the child's getting older, but, you know, this child running towards her and, you know field of daisies and just you know when just think back when you were a little girl how you you know imagined a prince charming or whatever it might be you know and so she always envisioned this happy you know happily ever after and that her daughter would come back and so she meets her daughter and the daughter is you know saying and it's all over television because everyone's interest in this case is saying you know my mom's no felon and she's talking about her kidnapper and and she's putting out there on you know, her daughter's putting out there on social media that her kidnapper's an amazing mother. And and so Shannara's seeing all of this going, wait, what? <laughs> you know, and it's just, it's, her story is absolutely tragic. And Gary and I, you know, as we sat there and we, you know, wanted her to retell what happened that day, there was, there was stuff that w no one had ever reported. We didn't realize that, that, I mean, family's always going to be a suspect, but we didn't realize to the degree how they treated her. You know, she took us from her life, which was pretty, pretty bad. She was molested. Um, she was homeless. Um, she was dropped off at a hospital to have a baby at the age of 16. By herself. Yeah, by herself. She had a baby. And this was not her first pregnancy. She had a she was pregnant when she was 14, and she miscarried. And so, you know, she she brought us into this world of, from the very beginning, we were just, like, dumbstruck. Like, my God, 
who does that? Who drops a child off to have a child? Right. And then you have this woman come in who's, you know, well-spoken. She's dressed like a nurse. And she was Shannara's only friend for five hours. She helped her change. She cleaned her body. She, you know, would hand her the baby and hold the baby. And she talked to her. I mean, you know, this is, this is a child who just gave childbirth, who has nothing stable in her life. Her own mother's not even there. She's off in Orlando. And, and you know, Shannara had... Shannara's baby was supposed to make her life right for the first time because her life was not right at all, even before the pregnancy. Um, And we were just, we were really touched by that. And it just, that continued, that whole theme continued throughout this whole, the whole series of every time we kind of touched on Shannara, of, of the heartbreak of how, you know her ch- her her chance at life, how it was snatched from her, um, and you know, she, Gary. right. And going back to the interview, you know, we we walked all the way from the time that that Kamai was kidnapped from the hospital to her discovery in January 2017, the ensuing months and about a year or so, and during all this time, all Shannara wanted was a daughter. Mm-hmm. She has other children, but but she wanted her, her her firstborn, and and she didn't get that. Even though they were talking, um, Kamaya still referred to Gloria Williams, the abductor, as her mother. And even on Mother's Day, Shannara was terribly hurt for two Mother's Days that she felt that um, Kamaya had not recognized her on Mother's Day. It was very hurtful to her. And during our interview with with Shannara, she she broke down and said, I wish she'd never been found because she didn't get this happily ever after moment that she's been craving for mm-hmm. 18 and a half, 19, 20 years now. So it was, a, it was a very striking moment. Yeah, and you just, you saw that she is still at 36. She's just as broken as she was when she was 16. And I mean, it was so raw. It was so heartbreaking. I just... So, you know, sitting here and, and writing the scripts, you know, for this story was painful. Um, you just, you, you can't erase, you know, what the emotions that you saw and unhear them and unfeel them. I, I, I don't, I, I cannot. Um, and so sitting there writing it, I, I was crying through quite a few of the chapters, um, just, you know, remembering her pain and, and, um, you know, reading her words, and I mean, she just, she laid it all out there, but yeah, when she said, I wish they never would have found her, it was one of those, what? Right. <laughs> and it, like, wow, she, and she finally said it, you know, um, and it, I mean, everything about this story is tragic, you know? Um, well, it's clear that you're a very empathetic reporter, too, and I think yeah. The best journalists are the most empathetic. Um, how do you think you can learn empathy as a reporter? Or is it something that you already have and that's what brings you to the job? That's a question for both of you. Hi. I've, I've, uh, right or wrong, I am that reporter that cries. Um, I remember being, it was the early 90s, I was at a press conference it was my first job at, a, at my first daily newspaper, and um, it was announced that the superintendent was gunned down by a fellow teacher, and immediately I'm standing there crying with my notepad right in the front, and all the older reporters are like, oh my God, what is she doing to this kid, you know? And I've, just, I've always been that reporter that I, I can't hide my emotions. I've tried, you know, when I do my best... Um, you know, if I'm going to be crying loudly, I will excuse myself. Um, it's just, I've, I've always worn my heart on my sleeve. Um, it confuses a lot of reporters. I've had photographers, actually, from competitors that don't know me come up and try and get my name for a cut line because they wanted me to be the subject because I had such emotion. Wow, right. And they're like, oh, wait, I'm a journalist, sorry. And like, why are you crying? And mm. I'm like, how can you not? You know, I just... I don't know how to explain it. Um, I think that the day that I do stop crying is the day I probably get another job because then my heart has just 
stopped. I mean, that it's me. It's you know, I, I can't. I, I try and I try and control it, um, but. Well, how do you think that's opened up your reporting? I well, I think that people. I think people are more inclined to talk to you if they can tell that you care. Um, and I, I mean, I'm fortunate enough that I have a job where I do care. I, 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 I'm given assignments and, and I work hard because I do care. And um, I think in the case of Shannara, she wanted to tell her story to someone who would listen. Yeah. A lot of times when people are approached by people in our profession, and, and I'll say, and this is not, this is just part of the job, but often in TV or radio or even print, I mean, people are shoving a microphone in your face. Mm -hmm. They want something they can pull out for 20 or 30 seconds. But Shannara just wanted someone to sit down and listen to her. She had a lot to say. She's very hurt. Mm -hmm. And she just wanted to get all that off her chest. And I think she just wanted to do it one time or two or three times, not share that same story with everybody. Because frankly, I don't, I'm not sure that everyone would take the time to, to let her do and say what she wanted to say. Right. So, so for each of you, what challenges came with made the, making this podcast series? Oh, I had a big one. <laughs> um, it was mid-May when uh, Mary Kelly Polka um, said, you know, clear your plate. Um, you know, I, I, let's do this, and I want you to focus on nothing but this. And so a couple weeks later, I was in her office, and... Um, I knew that my mom had a doctor's appointment that day, and so I had my phone on my lap, and it just started, I was on vibrate, but it just started blowing up, and I got some terrible news that she was terminal. Mm. So um, Mary Kelly said, okay, you know, and we had just sat down and talked about, I, I think I turned in 20 pages of an outline of what I was going to need to pull this off in this amount of time in terms of we're going to need photos for this for the website, audio of this, and it was just kind of a, I, you know, trying to figure out what we needed. And it was kind of overwhelming when we laid it all out, like, wow, we have to do this. And, and so I, I looked up and I said, my mom's cancer's back. Apparently it's terminal. They're calling hospice. And she said, go. And I said, mm, not yet. I, I don't know if that means she's going to die tomorrow or what, but, you know, um, I have a big family. Let's just, let's, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, and so that was a challenge. <laughs> Um, That's I, a big but, one. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I've always struggled with work-life balance. I have no balance. I, I go balls to the wall. Um, but my mom loved that about me. Um, and she called every day. And, you know, she would say, you know, do good at work today. And she'd ask how it was going. And she didn't want to believe that she was terminal. And so she wanted to talk to me about something that made her happy. And um, sadly, she died two days, two days before the first podcast came oh, out. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, but, you know, by doing a podcast, I actually got to spend time with my mom with the tape recorder. And so I started taping her voice without her knowing, and I started interviewing her without her knowledge. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, I just, I, if she would have said, you know, what are you doing? I would have told her, but I was... You know, it, it it made me want to have something to pass on to my nieces and nephews and for me and my wonderful brothers and sisters, um, you know, to have her voice. And so, yeah, so um, I'm not that bad of a daughter. It doesn't sound like <laughs> no. it. But no, no, I, no. I, you know, I, I sat there um, with the photo of my mom and my dad, who he died 12 years earlier. Um, and... Uh, as much as they did not want me to go into journalism because they knew I'd be poor and stressed out and <laughs> everything that I am, um, they they grew to love what I do. They really did. Um, and my mom, you know, I still have these letters she would send me as I won awards saying, your dad, I'm so proud of you, you know, um, when they really were very worried <laughs> and begged me not to go into this field. Um, but they, as as they retired to Florida, um, and they started keeping up on, on what I was doing and my passion. They were, they were thrilled with my decision. So wonderful. Yeah. So I didn't write, I sat there with a photo of them. And as I said, you know, Shannara makes me cry. And so 
you know, I, I cried a lot. <laughs> I, I just had a lot of tears as I was, you know, I poured my heart into this. Um, That's evident. Yes. And well, and it's, it's such a, it's a heartbreaking story. And um, it just, you know, the story can tell itself if you give it the time to be able to understand the story and to understand the feelings behind it, you know. So, right. What about you, Gary? What kind of challenges came with the first podcast? The first challenge was uh, learning the software to uh, to produce it. So, I spent uh, a couple of weeks kind of diving into that to figure out what I needed to do to make it work. Um, from there, out, as I mentioned earlier, I, I spent a considerable amount of time trying to find the right music that I thought would help tell the story in the podcast. So and he and, became the editor on this too, and so I would I was Mary Kelly actually had other commitments and she had to go take care of, and so Gary just took over as the editor of this. Wow. Um, yeah, and um, it was great. It was it was awesome. It really was. Um, and one of the challenges for all of us was learning to write for a podcast mm -hmm. rather than for print. Yeah, what's the difference there? <laughs> Well, I, I remember the first day um, that I brought like the introduction uh, to Mary Kelly and I was so proud of it and I think I'd been up to like three in the morning and I was like, oh, you, you're not going to believe this and I start reading it to we were actually driving to an interview and to uh, meet with Nat Glover and so I'm reading it to her and she's smiling. I'm like, you love it, you love it and she's like, no, I, I, I want to love it but you're being Eileen Kelly, the print reporter. You've, you've told me the ending in the first five minutes. <laughs> I was like, okay, so what do I do differently? She's like, no, it's like a book. You know, you take us through chapter by chapter. You've, you've just, you were a news reporter. You just told me the ending. So, um, so learning how to do that um, and learning how to, I guess it's, I guess it helps that I'm an NPR junkie. Um, but, you know, some of the, like a, a compliment for writing is if you say it sounds like NPR you know, where you can, like, you hear it and you can kind of feel it and, you know, the emotions of, of the human voice. And so I guess, you know, keeping an eye out for that. And there were so many voices and, you know, we had the, we had the audio from the court hearings from this case, and, and, and which I covered, you know, unknowing that, you know, I would be doing a podcast in a few months. Um, and so going back and looking at my notes, reading the transcripts, um, and saying, oh, this is going to be perfect. There's some, you know, here's some emotion here. And, and so, you know, it's like, it's like writing a book. Um, it was, it was a fabulous journey. It was, I just, I had so much fun with it. Well, we're um, so glad that you took the journey. It is an incredible show. And we hope our listeners will all subscribe to how, have you seen Kamaya? Cause it's truly terrific. And I'm excited to hear more podcasts from the Florida Times Union. That's going to be awesome. Well, we're so glad that you both decided to go into journalism. Oh, thank you. Yes, we really enjoy your reporting and your producing. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you on the show today. Thank you. Thanks. So be sure and give a listen to Have You Seen Kamaya? Yes, yes indeed. Can, and we will link on, that in yeah. our show notes for sure. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yes. yes. Thank you. Alrighty. We want to thank Eileen and Gary for coming on our show today. It was really enlightening to talk more about this tragic story and the way they've shed light on it in their podcast, Have You Seen Kamaya? Make sure, listeners, that you subscribe to their podcast. It's Have You Seen Kamaya? And it's through the Florida Times Union. Yes, you can learn more about the story also on jacksonville.com slash Kamaya. They have all the court documents and case files that they use for their research for the podcast on that website. Yes, and that's jacksonville.com slash Kamaya, K-A-M-I-Y-A-H. Yes, and also make sure you subscribe to our podcast, Completely Booked. Make sure you leave us a five-star rating and nicely written review. Learn more about our podcast at jackspubliclibrary.org slash podcast. While you're at it, listeners, if you don't have a library card, make sure you go ahead and get one. Yes, indeed. You can do all types of amazing research. You can come look at these old um, front page articles about this story in special collections at the library. You sure can. From 1998. We got them all. Learn how to use microfilm, kids. Ever heard of it? Nope, you haven't. So come check it out. Check it out. With your library card. Yes, and if you don't have one, come to any of our circ desks at all 21 library locations around town and figure out how to yes. get a library card. Yes, my own. Wow.
We're also excited to announce that we've been nominated for an award. An award! What? We're so excited to be on the Best of Jack's Ballot from Folio Weekly. We've been nominated for Best Podcast in the City. Can you believe it? I know it. So make sure you go to folioweekly.com slash bestofjacks and vote for Completely Booked, which is under Best Podcast on the Media category. Yes, yeah, so voting ends this Friday, October 12th, so make sure you guys get in there and vote. How many times can you vote? You can vote once a day. Once a day. So you have five more days to do it. Yes. Get on it, listeners. Let's do it. Help get us out, guys. And if you've been getting on it, get on it some more. Yep. We want to win. Once a day. Yes. This podcast was produced by Brian Thomas, a.k.a. BT, a.k.a. Producer Producer Brian. Brian. Goodbye.